Welcome to the SOS Show, live with Mary Evans. How you feeling tonight? So the SOS Show, people ask, it stands for Share Our Stories. Through sharing our stories, we can help people, right? Something that you're going through, somebody at home could be watching, and just give them that little more ink to keep fighting. We have to keep fighting. You know what I'm saying? So mass incarceration, this is part two. I did part one and it was so, uh, so, so great. We had men in the audience crying, mothers, but we coming together and giving them faith. You know, the United States only make up 5% of the population, but we in prison 25%. We send more people to jail than China, and China has a population of a billion people. We spend $100,000 approximately per head when we send someone to prison. Think about if we spent that money on the front end. And what we have to remember as I study that bothers me the most. They get caught doing things, they go do their time, then they come out and they're still in prison, social prison. They can't get a job. They can't get housing, can't get a loan, can't start a lot of businesses. A lot of them do the line work, but real businesses, bank don't want to deal with them. So I want to ask you today, have you ever did anything that if you was caught, you would have been to prison? Have you? So the only difference between some of them there and you is you didn't get caught. So if you had got caught, would you have wanted for the rest of your life someone to hang that over your head, that you made a bad choice for the rest of your life? That's what's happening to our people once they're discharged. So you have to remember that. You and I both have did things to go to prison. We just didn't get caught. So I want you guys to enjoy the show, and we're going to call up Quindale Mitchell, our first speaker. Please put your hands together. Hello, my name is Quindell Mitchell, and I did 15 years in prison. I did 15 years in prison for not things that I didn't do, but for things that I did do. So I won't get up here in front of you and tell you that I was a victim of unjust incarcerated, you know, incarceration and laws that were, you know, not balanced out for us. Because I put myself in a position for those laws that are imbalanced and unjust to work against me. So I want to talk about two things. One, prevention. In my life, I had issues with emotional problems, lack of self-identity. I was trying to be some, somebody else. And the somebody else that I was trying to be wasn't conducive to my freedom. The somebody else that I was trying to be wasn't productive for my family. It wasn't productive for my community, nor was it productive for the expansion of my community, my black people. It wasn't productive. So through the course of time, I started trying to play out all these different characters. I wanted to be the dope dealer. Wasn't good at it, didn't have the patience for it. So then I wanted to be the kick door guy, you know? Had a little bit too, com too much compassion for that, you know? Wanted to try my hand at making money that way wasn't my thing. One of the reasons why is because when God got a plan for you, the identity that you have for yourself don't pan out. It don't pan out. God had a plan for me. I came from a different type of cloth. The reason why I was out in the streets doing certain things and I had a feeling about it that it was wrong is because God already had planted a seed in me. My mother, deep in the church. And that's not the foundation of what I'm, I'm presenting there, but she was a spiritual person. My grandmother, 
spiritual person, very in tune with God. They planted those things in me. So every time I was out there in the streets, I'm trying to sell the dope. I had one situation where a sister came up to me and she wanted to sell me everything that she had on in terms of jewelry. And I gave her the dope for, away for free. Why? Because she told me, man, this is all I got. This is the last thing that make me feel like a human being. So I couldn't take it from her. I couldn't take it from her. So this character that I was trying to portray, I wasn't good at it. So the more I pushed and pushed and pushed against God, he said, I got to put you in a place. I got to take everything away from you to where you recognize that the only thing that would matter is your relationship with me. That's it. That's the only thing. So I catch a, a home invasion. <laughs> I go away. I'm sentenced. I go away. They place me into a holding cell by myself. Prime opportunity for me to go through a plethora of different emotional stages. The first one was I was confused. What am I going to do with all this time? What am I going to do? I can't even see the end of this. What am I going to do with all this time? The next one was anger. Skip it. You know what? When I get in there, I'm going to be a monster. Anybody come up to me, I'm going I'm to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do all these things. But I liken that into a situation where a person is thrown out of a boat into the ocean, right? You don't got nothing to hold on to. And you can only swim for so long. And the anger was me swimming in the ocean, you know? I'm swimming. But then I got tired. The anger couldn't hold me no more. So then I laid on the floor. I was sad. I'm the only person in this cell area before I go back, you know, to general population. I'm laying on the floor, and I'm sad. And I, I just told God, I said, I don't know what to do. I cried. I cried so hard. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Can you guide me? I don't know what to do. So he told me, let go. Let go, and I'm going to guide you through. When I went into prison, I had an idea to follow God in his various ways, however, in whatever direction he sent me. So, naturally, I was into art before I went to prison. He opened up the door for me to focus on my art. While I was in prison, I learned how to tattoo. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and uh, tattooing in prison is, is, is not really uh, a legal thing. In fact, you know, they'll put you in, in the hole for tattooing in prison for self-mutilation, right? I think that there should actually should be a program in prison you know, about the proper aspect of tattooing because it's a large, viable industry, you know? So anyway, I started tattooing. I learned how to tattoo from a white supremacist. <laughs> Say that again. I learned how to tattoo from a white supremacist. Look how God work. Tattooing right now feeds me and my family. Look how God work. This man came to me and he wasn't a great artist, and he needed somebody to draw for him. Now, I, in the course of me, in prison, I've read over 1,500 books. One of the books that I read was Without Sanctuary. And this book has a bunch of horrid pictures of the injustices and the crimes that white folks have prosecuted on black people. And that puts something in my heart, you know? So when this man, a white supremacist, comes to me asking me to draw for him, I immediately, what? Man, if you don't get out of my face, you know what I do to you, right? 
had a few friends come to me. They say, man, can you just do it? Because we trying to get tattooed, you know? We trying to get tattooed, you know? So I end up succumbing to the peer pressure. Start drawing for the guy. Drew so much for him that he ended up acquiring a clientele that was too big for him to handle himself. So his next proposition to me was, hey, can you take on some of my clientele? I'll teach you how to tattoo. So he taught me. Later, I took this, this skill and I came out here right, along with some other things that I'm, I'm involved in currently, but I came out here, I opened up a tattoo shop, I've traveled around the United States tattooing, I am one of the best, I won't just say black tattooers, but tattooers in the state of Michigan, right? Um, so, when I let go of my identity and what I was trying to, trying to do, God gave me a new identity and a platform that allowed me to be able to grow and help others with it. I have an organization called Dare to Inspire where we teach children art, we have art programs, we also go to neighborhoods um, where we clean up and we paint murals. We just did one on Sanderson Street over here if you guys are from Pontiac. Um, so, what I'm saying is prison was a very horrid place. However, any environment where you allow God to be the dictator, it changes. It changes. So I thank you guys for listening to my story. I hope that it imparted something on somebody's heart and it can help someone. Like I said, once again, my name's Quindle Mitchell. Let's give it together for Quindle Mitchell. All right, next we have Mr. Dwight Harris. Five years, five years prison. Sound, what it sound like? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, prison for me, the effects of prison was horrid, <laughs> just like you said, um, because the people in there, it's a bunch of bad people in prison. I was a kid, I was young when I went to prison. I was 17 years old. Just a little about my background. I was a child, sibling, I had six siblings, but I never knew any of my siblings. I was raised by my great-grandmother, my father's grandmother. And so <clears throat> when I think about my life in relation to my life as I got older, I think about standing in the window behind, do you, everybody remember those curtain, those draperies? And so as a kid, you know, we always looked out the window, whether it's for Santa Claus or somebody coming. We always, it, it took a lot of strength to move the drapes back and get in there. And so I used to be there waiting on my mother and she never came. And so it was like, 10, 12 years into my incarceration, I started understanding what actually affected me as a kid. And it was the abandonment and my mother not being there and always waiting on her to come, but she never came. And so I went on with my life. I had so many problems as a kid. I had problems on the street, on the block. I had authority problems. I didn't want to listen to nobody. I went to school, I had problems. Didn't want to listen to nobody. I was real rebellious to everything. Never understood though. But it was okay with me as a kid because I was doing what I wanted to do. I always wanted to do what I wanted to do. And so I've always did what I wanted to do. And so I ended up in prison. And so for the sake of time, I'll talk a little bit more about me going to prison. When I went to prison, I went for assault with intent to murder, two for the gun. 
So they charged me with assault with intent to murder. They charged me with assault with intent to rob by arm. They wanted to charge me with um, taking a person hostage or whatever. But I was a kid. I had went to prison for a small amount of time and came home in a short amount of time. And in the short amount of time that I came home, I acted a fool. I never was helped. So I ended up going to prison for all this time of my life. And so when I went, I didn't have an idea what I was going to do when I went in there though. All I know is that I was going to be strong. Everything I learned in the streets, that's what I was going to be. And I was going to do whatever I had to do to survive in prison. I was a little thing like this big. But I had a lot of heart. And so, here I am looking at, and it actually looked just like this, a little bit. Where you're standing on this bulkhead, and when you come in, you just see all this area, but a whole bunch of steel and bricks. And so as a kid, I was like, well, what I got myself into now? But all I could go on is the strength that I fashioned into myself to be this powerful person. Because I thought I was powerful as a kid. Because anytime a child do what he want to do, you think you're powerful. And you have a lot of things in your mind to make you think that nobody can stop you. I was the one that felt like nobody could stop me. And so I went to prison with that attitude. And that attitude led me in segregation probably almost four years one time, which is the hope. And then probably two times the other time. And then all the other times I probably got 90 days or I might got a year. So I spent probably six or seven years in segregation out of 25 years in prison. And the reason I talk about segregation because when I was in population, I acted a fool. So everybody know. People don't just go to prison and act good. People go to prison and do the same thing they was doing in the streets. So when I went to prison and the record was show, I did everything I did in the streets. I wasn't a drug dealer. I was violent. I was real violent as a kid. I never tried to sell drugs. It never was an interest of mine. I just was lost. <laughs> and everything I did, I had no respect for people at all. I didn't even respect the life of nobody, really, as a kid. And so I was in segregation when I thought about changing my life. I just wanted to do something different. I got tired, really. I just got tired of people judging me. Because when you're in segregation, going to the hole is like going to court. And so you got to stand before somebody and they got to ask you, why did you stab that man? Why did you beat the police up like that? I was never a person to ask, answer questions. So I never had an answer when they asked me that. So it don't make sense, but when a lot of the guys that I came up with, when we were going to uh, be sentenced or uh, asked questioning in prison for something we did, we never went. I went to this, and so some of the hearings I knew that was real serious, like one of the times I chased the police around the unit with a knife, tried to kill him because I didn't want to go to the hole because they was taking me to the hole for stabbing the guy about 16 times from coming from the gym and the police not wanting me to talk to the guys on my way from the gym because you can't hold up traffic in prison. You can't know where you get a ticket for that. And because I did that, I was going to go to the hole and then I beat him up. <coughs> yeah, I beat him up real bad. And that's the one that put me in the hole almost four years. And so the reason I want to talk about that is because one of the things about prison, you don't go to prison to get help. I never got no help when I went to prison. And from that time, from the first day all the way to two years before I came home is when I got some help. In between that time, I had to figure myself out. 
I just was going back and forth to the hole, the hole, the hole, smashing guys. I wasn't buying nothing. I was working out because I was, I was a real small guy, but then I ended up getting muscular. And everybody in there was bigger than me. And so I always said, stood for who I was and what I stood for. And one day, I said, well, why not take that energy just to be somebody else? Not for the change, though, but for the maturity. People know what you talking about. Well, I didn't never sit down and say, you know what, I ain't doing that no more. I just changed one day when I was in segregation. I wasn't doing it no more. And then I realized that changing wasn't just good enough for me. I needed to do something to myself. What you talking about? Well, I need to discipline myself. I need to take away some of the things that I've done or that I do every day to build my courage and my strength up to go against myself because nobody else can do it. Now, this is a real true story. Nobody else can do it for me. So I end up disciplining myself by I quit eating meat, I quit cussing, I quit cussing for 11 whole years. And I read the Bible probably 11, years, 11, 11 times in my whole prison sentence. 11 whole times, like just a whole read. And I read, I'm an avid reader now. Then I read so much after reading George Jackson, I just felt like reading was everything. And so when I start reading, I start learning myself. I start learning about programming, organization, myself. Uh, I mean, I read so much to the point where I just felt like I was ready to go home. I also met you guys for probably 17 years of being in prison. And a lot of people don't know that about me. And just a little bit about me now because this was about the effects of incarceration. So... I learned how to help people in prison because when I was in society, I didn't help nobody do nothing. It was all about me. And so now my life is just dedicated to helping people. So when I came home, my whole thing was, what can I do the same that I was doing in prison? And what I did in prison was help people 24-7. And everybody looked up to me. And I helped and I saved a lot of young guys coming to prison too. A lot of young guys I say come from prison. I couldn't say the ones still had their head going crazy. They want to do what they want to do. And then a lot of guys went over there and other things happened to them. You know, it's a lot of things that go on in prison. And so when I came home, my whole thought was, I just don't want to go back. <laughs> and all I knew is that you're supposed to work. Because in truth, that's all I knew. <laughs> just work. Work, man. Just work. Stay out of trouble. Stay away from the guy. That's all they tell you. But it's so many things that I'm encountering since I've been home. Uh, technology. I've been home eight years, but technology. When I first came home, I would not go outside at all. And then I look at the computer, but I know when I was on the phone, when I was in prison, everybody talked about the computer. But I would just look at it because I, I didn't know what to do with it. So I ended up going to college. I went to college. And then... Yeah, I end up going to college, and then I end up getting like five good jobs because I don't have a lot of time. So I was, uh, mm, I was uh, sore. I was sewing bulletproof vests. Then I got a job for asbestos abatement. Then I went from there. I was working in the school as a security guard. And then I went from there. I was working at Fridays as a cook. Don't know how to cook, but I knew how to cook that though. <laughs> And then I went from there being the case manager for Detroit. That was a lot of stuff, wasn't it? <laughs> so I learned how to be a case manager. But guess what I learned? That I was a case manager in prison. Everything that we did in there, we did everything out the book. People don't know that we in prison, we would sit there and just look at the book and then say, oh, this is how we do it. We'd run outside and say, hey, man, this is how we do this. <laughs> right? <laughs> Come on, man. Oh, did you see that uh, in the flex and how you work out and this and that? And your muscles supposed to look like this and you supposed to... That's why you would talk to a guy that come over prison. He would tell you ain't nothing he don't know. Because <laughs> we studied everything. <laughs> it's nothing you can tell me when I was in there. I knew everything. Because if I didn't know, I could run back in there and look it up and come back and say, hey, man, I just, I know about this. And we would sit there and dialogue stuff for hours in and hours out in prison. 
We would do that in the hole. We used to argue in the hole. <laughs> I'm just making it fun now. <laughs> this is stuff we used to do. I'd be in the, man, forget you. And then we get to talking about the spirit for a long time. And you don't know what you talking about. You was a killer out there anyway, so don't holler down here talking about no spirit. No more. <laughs> but these the, these the type of conversations we used to have in prison. It don't make sense to you. Like you told the guy, yeah, man, you was a rapist or you was, you know, we used to do things to each other like that when we get mad. We couldn't fight all the time. Like people think in prison, you just fight, fight, fight. People don't fight like that in prison. If you see it, you be like, oh, people don't fight like that. People are respectful in prison. People come home, that's why you say, no ma'am, no sir, because people don't be buying that in prison. <laughs> <laughs> like when they come home, it ain't about you, it's about what they was at. <laughs> the don't respect him, don't say, well, which one do you respect in prison? Don't disrespect nobody. Everybody potentially kill you in here. <laughs> That's real though. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had to get a little human. It's, it's humans, but it's real. We all was affected by it. We were traumatized, and they sent us home. And so God has blessed me to allow me to continue the work that I was doing in prison. Some of the things a lot of people don't know, I was doing the same thing I'm doing now in prison. And so, when I think about prison, yeah, prison is necessary. We have to change a lot of laws. We have to change sentencing. The reason we have to change the sentencing, because the way that they created the grid was way back then. It's 2019 now. You can't give a juvenile life no more. You shouldn't give him 25 years. But they say, well, give him 25 years, that's not life. But 25 years of life, I did it. So these things are doing, we create an organization. I work with the wrongful conviction, convicted. I created innocent maintain around the brother. And we are pushing wrongful conviction all across the country. <laughs> We're stopping. And I'm working with the guys. I'm helping them react with me. Most of the designeries in Detroit I work with. And we talk with all the designeries around the country. And then with Icon 10, that's me. I-C-O-N underscore two times or three times. Number 10 is who I am. I can overcome negativity. You can, I can, everybody can. We can overcome negativity. And so what I want to do with my vision, I just want to see people just change their life. Do different. Do better. And so what I do is work with the whole city for the most part. Anybody I can help with and I can give back, I do. And I always speak about guys in prison. We can't forget them because they're coming home. They don't do prisoners the way they used to do. They will let them come home. Don't think that everybody's going to be locked up for life because they killed somebody because they're coming home. And the thing about that, it's a good thing. Because you have to understand the guys that come home, though. Take your time and understand where he's at. Because he's not the same person. But that don't mean that he better, neither. <laughs> I got to tell you that. But pay attention to guys and support them where you can help them at. Don't tell them nothing that you can't do. Because guys in prison don't know the difference. You know, when you say something, we hold everybody to what we say in prison. So if somebody out here tells us something and then they don't do it, we're going to hold them to them. And you don't even know that. Well, this is the life of a guy that went to prison. So there's so many things. My lifestyle is different than yours or different than his or the men you may know. And so you'll find a lot of women having problems with men. When they come home, because you talk to them like the rest of the men out here. We're not used to that. It's not no slap. <laughs> it ain't no slap to nobody, but the effects of incarceration, it's not good. And I just ask everybody, if you got somebody in prison, support them. And if you can support legislation, laws, anything that can change, that can help make it better for guys that's in prison, please do so. Thank you. much. All right, our last best for, we say the best for last, Stacy Barker, come on up please. Yes. Hello, I would like to thank everybody for having me. 
I like a little audience participation, so if you could all repeat after me, I'd really appreciate it. One, nine, nine. One. one, one, two, two. Four. four. That was the ID number the Michigan Department of Corrections gave me when I first came to prison. I've been home for 10 years, and I spent 22 years, three months, and 18 days in prison for killing a man on my job who was attempting to sexually assault me. Because of this, after 13 years, Judge Damon Keith, somebody that I owe the rest of my life to, made me one of the first women in the state of Michigan to ever have a mandatory life sentence totally vacated by the federal court. When I came home, I had a chance to meet Judge Damon Keith because a man named Trevor Coleman, who was Jennifer Grant Holmes' speechwriter, and he was most recently one of the senior writers down at the Michigan Chronicle, he was writing Judge, da Judge Damon Keith's book. So he was writing an article on me that was published in April of 2010 in BLAC magazine. That's Black Life, Arts, and Culture. It's a free magazine. So anyways, um, Trevor told me that he was writing Judge Damon Key's book. And I told Trevor, oh my God, I got to meet him. And he was like, why? I was like, because of him, that's why I'm home. He was like, I remember you said that in your story. And I was like, yeah. So one day I was walking, um, I was downtown going to the federal court building. And I saw this man going across the street. I had never seen Judge Damon Keith before in my life, ever. I had seen him in books, I had seen him in magazines, I had seen him in a newspaper, and I don't know, but I just knew this was Judge Damon Keith, and he was a little stooped over. I came home August 25th of 09. This was in like 2010. So I was in the parking lot, and I wanted to run across the street and say, excuse me, is your name Judge Damon Keith? But I was on parole, and I didn't want to run up on a federal judge. So I just walked really fast. So when I walked up to him, I was like, excuse me, can I please give you a hug and a kiss? So he looked at me, and he said, a hug and a kiss? And I said, yes, please. I know he was looking at me like, why is she smiling, and why does she want to hug and kiss me? So he let me, and so I gave him a big, warm hug, and I gave him a kiss on his cheek. And he said, now, what was that for? And I said, it was for saving the rest of my life. So he looked at me, and he said, how did I do that? And I said, well, in 2010, you, Judge Hull, and Judge Ryan were on the Sixth Circuit in Cincinnati, and my attorney, Stuart G. Friedman, was there doing an oral argument for me. And your opinion helped me so much because you said that a woman has a right to use deadly force to prevent a sexual assault. My judge in Oakland County, Fred Mester, he failed to tell the jury that. I had two trials. The first trial ended in a hung jury. Everybody wanted to give me second degree murder. One man wanted to give me manslaughter. They deliberated for three days and they declared it a hung jury. I testified at that trial. Um, I wasn't crying. I was just very matter-of-factly, and I was speaking. So my attorney, Charles Campbell, he said, at the next trial, don't testify. And I was like, but why? Because mind you, I didn't know nothing about the legal system. All I knew is that I was on my job. I killed this man who was trying to sexually assault me, and I want to say what I need to say. He said, they're going to look at you like a hostile witness. So under advisement of my attorney, I didn't testify. They all came back and found me guilty of first-degree murder. I had life life. I didn't have any numbers. So while, when I got there, well, first of all, Fred Mester said, when you leave, you're going to leave in a pine box. So I didn't make any facial expressions. I wasn't disrespectful. I just stood there, and I looked at him, and then I, they took me to the bullpen. But when I got to that pool pen, I was pissed. I was like, I will not leave in a pine box. You had better believe that. 
when I went into in, when I went into prison, it wasn't all nice, and I acted up, but I quickly got it together because I had a daughter who was three years old, two months and ten days the day I was arrested, and I knew that I did not want to go back out there with nothing. I knew I needed therapy. I knew I needed substance abuse. I knew I needed to get it together because she deserved a mother who could bring something home tangible, not just no memories. So when I got there, I started fighting immediately. I only had a GED when I got there. In 1993, I got my associate's degree from Mount Com Community College with a 3.86 GPA. In 2000, I got my bachelor's degree from Western Miss University with a 3.42 GPA. And then I was just doing everything because I wanted to do everything. I took any type of therapy I could get. I got my paralegal certificate. I worked in the law library. I helped women fight cases. I helped women do divorces. I helped women beat tickets. A lot of the officers would get mad at me, but I didn't care because a lot of times the officers were wrong. Sometimes the officers were right. But while I was there, I was sexually assaulted by three officers on three different occasions. So, what did I do? I didn't roll over. Everybody was telling me, girl, be quiet. Don't say nothing. It happened all the time. Oh, Stacy, you about to get us? What? I was like, no. So, the first officer, he got probation. And some of the other women that was happening to, I tried to get them to join a lawsuit with me. And they was like, uh-uh. They were scared to death because retaliation and harassment, it runs rampant. It's almost like you're being tortured because these are the people that got control over you. I didn't care. I did it by myself, and I won. And all, and all in all, I filed well, I filed and I fought on, I was a named plaintiff, or I was a class representative in six major class action lawsuits while I was there, and I was victorious in all of them. When I first came to prison, a male officer told me to grab the wall. He wanted to shake me down under the pretense of looking for contraband. So I was like, okay, because I knew I didn't have any contraband on me. So I grabbed the wall, but he felt me up. And when I say he felt me up, he was squeezing and touching, on areas that he shouldn't have. So that just like disgusted me because I just felt like if I want to be touched, I'm going to tell you that I want to be touched. And I'm going to tell you where to touch me at. But anyways, I just felt like how can a man, a stranger, I mean, just do this? And there's nothing you can do about it because if you refuse, you can go to segregation. So then um, a male officer could work in your housing unit. So you might be in bed, sleep, you know, the sheets might not stay on you, and a man could actually shine a light in your window. I know specifically of two, two women who got pregnant while incarcerated. Um, I can remember a time when I was in the shower and a male officer snatched a curtain back and I was like, and he said, oh, my bad. I thought I saw two sets of feet. And there was nothing I could do about it. So when I tell you I made so much noise, you know how they say the squeaky wheel? I was a squeaky wheel. I did not care. And they was like, girl, they gone, they gone. And I was like, what can they do to me? They can't do nothing else to me. I got a mandatory life sentence. And I would talk just like that. I got a mandatory life sentence. What can they do to me? Nothing. No, I mean, really nothing. They would tell me, oh, Mr. So-and-so cool. Don't get him put out the unit. I would just look at them and say, baby, you'll thank me later. So by the time we finish with our lawsuits, a man cannot shake a female, a um, male officer cannot shake a female prisoner down in the state of Michigan. <laughs> a male officer can no longer work in a housing unit in the state of Michigan. So, 
So because of my noise, and Deborah LaBelle was an attorney that I met in 1988, and we're still really good friends to this day. Deborah LaBelle helped me so much. And when I say so much, I mean so much. She hooked me up with the right people. I was talking to everybody. The Human Rights Watch did a report on me. It's called Nowhere to Turn. The Amnesty International did a report on me. I was just the Justice Department. They came in and they interviewed a lot of women. At the end of my incarceration, I wanted to do more for the women. So they let me run a self-help group. And it was called Believing in Yourself and Being Successful. Because at the end, they had taken away all the stuff that was supposed to get you reassimilated back into society, you know, pre-release and all of that stuff. So I graduated over 600 women out of my group. Wow. And the state let me do it. So I went from a level four, five, with 35 plus points in SIG to doing what I needed to do to help the women. So today, I'm gainfully employed and I'm living a pretty good life. Stacey, let's give an applause for Stacy. Thank you so much. Wasn't there some awesome speakers tonight? We changing lives by sharing stories. They were awesome, awesome. So guess what? Every third Thursday, we come live here. Everybody come to the stage, please. Oh, we, oh man, thank you for being here. Oh, we got to see, uh, you know, there's so many things that we need to work on, work at in our community, our people. Always bring ideas. Everything about the SOS show is things that we deal with. Come on in here like we love each other. Things that we deal with, right? And we deal with a lot of things, right? All right, let's pump that music up now. Come on, y'all, let's go out. S-O-S, yes, S-O-S. We gonna leave a legacy. Thank you. Hi, are you a business owner and you need funding to grow your business or you've been told that you need a business plan to turn into a lender so that you can get funding to grow your business? QT Business Solutions can help you. If you have a 575 credit score, you are not 60 days past due on any IRS debt, child support or student loans. If you've had any bankruptcies as long as they're one year old or foreclosures as long as they're 24 months old, we still might be able to help you get funding to grow your business. Give us a call. 